Ursula, Jemima, would you like a special treat today? Were well, they all ready? You like them, don't you, sweeties? Okay. Good afternoon from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry, and we are in the back, looking towards the woods and into this meadow over here, which is going to provide us today with a lot of foliage and flowers for dried flowers over the winter. We cut this field once or twice a year, but we never got around to it this year. And I'm kind of glad because it's just filled with goldenrod. And goldenrod dries really well gives you lots of great color over the winter months. For wreaths and flower arrangements, your dried flower bouquets, when you can't get fresh cut flowers in the winter, then go out into the fields and the meadows and see what you can gather. Now goldenrod is often mistaken for ragweed, but it isn't ragweed. This is not ragweed. I'm going to show you some ragweed. Don't let this go to waste. This is a really great pollinator. It um, grows in meadows and fields along streams. It's very tall, can grow to about 10 feet tall. The bees love it, the butterflies love it. And like I say, it dries really beautifully. So let's take a look at goldenrod. It just tower over your head and you can see by the leaves that they're long, narrow leaves, not adjacent to one another on the stem. And the flowers are tiny little tubes which open up to these star-like flower heads. Here we have a smaller version of the goldenrod growing in this ditch and this one has much smaller stems much smaller leaves and the flowers are much more delicate but growing right alongside this is the dreaded ragweed so now is a perfect time to show you the difference between the ragweed and the goldenrod because people often mistake the goldenrod for ragweed and, and you don't want to do that because they are absolutely very very different to be honest with you. As you can see growing along this ditch we have no shortage of the dreaded ragweed but you can really see the difference between the two plants because the ragweed is very very nondescript not exactly a beautiful plant um, and just basically it's green. Even when the little seed heads open into their flowers they're tiny, tiny, pale, pale, almost white, little cabbage-like things. But each one of these little things produces so much pollen. And this is pollen that is carried by the wind. Whereas 
the goldenrod, the solidago family. These are pollinated by insects. Leaves are very much different. As you can see, the leaves of the ragweed are serrated. So you can plainly see the difference between the goldenrod and the ragweed. So as you go along collecting your plants, just clip them and then strip the lower leaves like so. There, because these are just going to be air dried. You don't need all that extra foliage on there because what you really want is the color of the flower head. Now, seen from afar, this would look like goldenrod. But it's actually a plant from the Verbacena family, and it's called the wing stem plant. And I think it's really interesting. When you get up close to this, you can see it's quite different than the goldenrod. The flower head has little ray and disc flowers. So the little discs in the middle, they will open just a small bit and then the other ones stick out like rays of sun. This is called the wing stem plant because of the way the leaves come out of the stem like, like a nice pair of wings just coming right out of the stem like that. And um, they dry really beautifully too. Now there's a plant growing next to this that would be oh so beautiful in flower arrangements unfortunately it's pretty poisonous. Here it is, pokeweed. I would love to put those little pokeweed pods in an arrangement, but the problem is that every part of this plant is pretty toxic. So it's best just to avoid it all together and just look at it from afar. Further back into the wood, I see something beautifully purple right here. And that would be ironweed. Ironweed likes moist areas. It's a real butterfly magnet. It grows sometimes about seven to eight feet tall, but this one's pretty low. And there are about 13 to 30 heads, um, I mean blossoms, on the flower head here. These dry really well and they keep their color really nicely. So if you have a patch of these or you see some alongside the road, these are a great one to find. I found a nice little patch right here. They're kind of sparse. They don't have really thick clusters of flowers, but if you can get a nice handful of them, um, you can still make a nice color combination with your yellow goldenrod. I'm always happy when I run across just a few thistle plants because they dry so beautifully. If you can get over the fact that they're covered in thorns, which are easily removed with a flick of the thumb and a gloved hand, obviously, but I love to get them when they look like this. So there are a couple heads here. I'm going to wait on those and let them bloom, but I'm definitely going to take these gorgeous fluffy heads before they start producing seed like that. Even though that would be very pretty in a dried arrangement too. It really would. It's a very interesting pod. We definitely have to get some of those and then come back maybe in about a week and get the rest after they've bloomed. So let's see what else we can find. Any other interesting things that you can gather like acorns, pine cones, moss. Look at this gorgeous moss. Just love that. I think the privet has beautiful little berries on it, but if you want to use it, you've got to get these berries while they're green. If you get them when they turn purple, they just fall right off. But if you keep them like this, when they get nice and green, then that's the time when you can dry them. And they will stay for a little while. The donkeys love to eat these.
So when you're gathering things to make dried flower arrangements over the winter, just use your imagination. There's so many things that can be used. So many wonderful plants that we consider weeds so often, but they're just as beautiful as anything you could grow in your garden. I think that is. Hey, I'm tempted just to take some of these green walnuts off the tree. <laughs> they would be great on a wreath. Just look at the beautiful pods, purple pods, on the hyacinth pole bean vine. Now those would be gorgeous on a wreath. I have to grab some of those too. So if you stop by the right side of the road, or maybe you have a farm nearby, or you live on a farm yourself, or near the woods, wild flowers are pretty easy to find. Some may consider these weeds, but they look just as beautiful in a dried bouquet as any cultivated flower. And these thistles, as you can see, are pretty easy to de-weaponize. And when you're done, it's just as smooth as glass. But not up here. Still pretty prickly up here. But just look how beautiful those are. And when I've dried these in the past, they really, really, really stay purple. They lose a little bit of their color, but you know, that gives them this beautiful old antique look. And that's what happens with all of them. They all lose a little bit of color, but they still have that sort of look of um, antiquity about them. Settle down. It's kind of like shucking corn, only it's a lot easier. So this is a nice little basket full of wild plants and flowers that would make wonderful arrangements for the winter. Even if I don't use these, I will take these into the garden room now, I'll tie them into small bunches, hang them upside down, and they'll still look beautiful even if I don't use them. As I said, I'm sure that I will, but even if I didn't, they just look beautiful hanging on a wall. And they're a piece of work, uh, art in and of themselves, just hanging there drying. Many of the flowers from your garden dry beautifully as well, such as roses. They're pretty delicate though, so handle those with care when you're drying them. And vineyards are great to dry. Now I'm talking about air drying on all of these, but there are other ways of drying flowers. We're just not going to go into that at this time. Sedum is a beautiful plant to dry for the winter. And Rutabecchia, also known as Black-Eyed Susan. Also, cone flowers are good. And Dahlias, of course, these were in a vase, and so they're looking a little bit raggedy. Don't know what's going to happen with those. So you're going to get a lot of color from the plants from your garden as well. So here we are, next to the cold frame, which is right outside the door of the garden room. Let's just Step take a look. the garden room. Let's take a look at this cold frame. This is a cold frame, which actually used to be in the potager, but we moved it to the back of the house, right on the courtyard and right outside the garden door. It's a lot more convenient here. Oh, excuse this old fella. This is the oldest goose I have. This is Attila, and I think he's probably, I'll bet, in a, in human years he's about 80 years old and he's having a little bit of trouble but we try to treat him very nicely and give him a lot of treats so that he's comfortable in his senior years. Stop it Keats. Keats is bumping me. Or hot frame or nursery bed. You can call it whatever you like because it can be used for all of those things and I basically call it a poor man's greenhouse. If you don't have a greenhouse at least get yourself a cold frame because these are just so convenient. As for myself, I've never really had a desire to have a greenhouse. Maybe that's because I've got a garden room, I've got a gardening porch, and I've got a potting shed, and I don't really think I need a greenhouse. Um, so here we have a handle, glass top, 
I use string here so that I can attach it to a hook on the wall if I want to leave it open or I want to work in the bed. And then looking inside. at this, you can see that it's pretty easy to ascertain how this is built. It's a pretty simple job. You can find directions all over YouTube on building a small or a large cold frame. And as I said, it's simply a box with a taller back than a front. It has no bottom and you can set it directly on the ground or directly on a patio and of course your top is going to be glass or clear plastic obviously that's to let the light in the heat of the sun and also because these close tightly this keeps out the cold of winter in the very cold sitting directly on top of the concrete so I didn't have to put this cardboard in but if I were to lay this on the bare ground or maybe on a patch of grass out in the yard I would definitely lay this cardboard down I just wanted to to show you that the cardboard will disintegrate and it will prevent any weeds from coming up if you're laying your cold frame directly onto the ground but also I put a tin lining that goes underneath the wood as well just to keep it from rotting out too quickly seeing as it is going to get water and it's got soil on it and then all along the long edges I lined it with brick and stone just to keep the wood from rotting away too quickly because these don't last forever but they last for a long time now what I would do after the cardboard is I lay a layer of manure which I have donkey dung right here and then I'm beginning to layer some well rotted compost on top of that so I'm going to go about eight inches with the compost on top of the donkey dung and then I can do with this whatever I want so these are great for winter crops for raising lettuces in the dead of winter because with the doors closed or should say the lids shut down and it just keeps the heat inside like a, a little nursery house. If you're in an extremely cold area, you can um, outline this whole thing with bales of hay and that'll keep it even warmer. But for starting plants in the spring or growing plants in the winter, a cold frame is really a great thing to have. These are antique windows that we found and in order to adjust the height because sometimes you're going to want to let some air into your little greenhouse in case it's spring and it gets to be a very hot day and you're starting your seedlings are going you don't want to fry them just like any other plant that would be sitting in a window you want to make sure they get a little bit of air so you can make your lids adjustable we just do it with twine and a hook on the wall but there are many other ways that you can get your lids to go up and down to whatever height you wish. So my use for this over the winter will be I'll probably do half of this in maybe spinach or lettuces and keep the lettuce going. And the other half I want to use as a nursery bed over the winter for plants that need a really long push start which would be things like perennials like Canterbury Bells, Biennials, even Hollyhocks could be started in here, Foxgloves, salvias, uh, I've got some penstem and I want to get going and those are perennials they take a lot longer than annuals they take a lot longer to give them a good start and a cold frame is a good place to really be able to nurture them and take good care of them. So you have time to build yourself a cold frame it doesn't take a lot of carpentry skills to do it as I said it's simply a box with a slanted glass lid. By the way, this is Keats. This is one of our boys. <laughs> the garden room. We've been working on this room for about a week because it's in pretty bad shape. Let me show you what it looked like. But after about a week of scraping and 
plastering and repairing these those big holes in the ceiling. I think it's looking pretty decent. Now it's the room still isn't finished. We have a really great light fixture to go right there. But what makes this a garden room basically is the light, the natural light in the room. It makes it so bright and cheerful. It's um, pretty much the end of the day right now, so it's six o'clock, so it's not sunny out. But normally during the day, this room is simply filled with beautiful natural light. When we started um, the transformation of this room last year, I mentioned to you that this has been uh, all sorts of things. <laughs> it was basically a tool shed for years. It was just full of tools and junky shelves. And I think at one time it was a kitchen. It was a mud room. You know, I don't even know what it originally started out as, but I know that right outside the door when I first moved here, there had been a root cellar right outside the door. Unfortunately, they buried the root cellar. I wish they hadn't done that. Would have loved to have had that root cellar. But um, I don't know. I think it's basically a lean-to off the back of the building. It is original to the house, and it's gone through many transformations, but I think this is probably the best one it's had, seeing as now it's going to get a lot of use, and it's really a, kind of a pretty room. We were going to take the ceiling down because it had so much repair work that needed to be done, and we were going to cover it with beadboard, but we just decided instead to repair it, save the money, and it actually took an awful lot of work to do. And now it looks pretty much like a plaster ceiling, which I think is kind of nice because that's what this house has, is a lot of plaster. The color of the paint is Butter Up by Valspar 2000. It's a great paint. Um, it's not bright yellow like in my kitchen, which is more of a mustard color. It's a very pale yellow and it's very soft and, and beautiful in this room, especially against that forest green trim on all the windows. So what exactly is a garden room? Well, I think it's different things to different people. You can almost call it uh, a little conservatory, depending on what you do with the room. But if it's full of light, like this one is, and as I said, it's six o'clock in the evening, so it's not that bright in here right now. But this, for me, is a place where I can do a lot of gardening, winter gardening. I can do a lot of flower, dried flowers on this long, wonderful long table here. I can do seedlings, uh, since the cold frame is right outside the door here. I can gather my seeds together. I can separate seeds. I mean, this is really a working area right here for me. But the whole place is basically a working area. Let's just take a little walk around the room and I'll show you. Because I think it's a fun room. Let me tell you about my great big beautiful Colorado seed box. I got this seed box at my first auction that I ever went to. It was about 30 years ago. And it was a farm auction in Colorado where I used to live. And this big, beautiful seed box was in a box of junk, in a cardboard box full of junk. And it was inside that box, and it was closed. But I happened to look inside, open it up, and found this treasure, which I thought everybody was going to be bidding on. And since it was my first auction, and I really didn't know what I was doing, when it came time to bid on that box, that cardboard box, I kept bidding against myself. But nobody else was even bidding. I was just bidding against myself. <laughs> But I ended up getting it for about $3. So it started out at about 50 cents, and then I kept bringing the bid higher and higher for some strange reason. But I thought I got a real bargain for $3, this beautiful seed box right here. And, of course, I keep my seeds in it, in the house, in the winter. Other than that, I usually keep them outside on the porch. So he came from the flea market about five years ago, and he's been keeping me company ever since. His tail's a little frazzled, and he's a little worn, just like me, but he's always happy as long as he has a bouquet of flowers. So he likes to sit there in the window. When you're drawing your plants, you can go right ahead and make some tiny bouquets. Just go ahead and wrap them up and arrange them as little bouquets, little tussy mussies. Hang them upside down on a small rack or just hang them flat and then you have some very lovely little gifts to give away after they're dry.
You see what I mean about the dried flower arrangements? They just have a, the colors are so subtle that they have a really lovely nostalgic look to them. They're very different than fresh bouquets. But here we have the Bonisset, the Ironweed, the straw flowers, and a zinnia. Already dried. I made the bouquet just like that. Hung it upside down. And within just two days, I had a nice little gift to give away. And here we have the um, Gomprina, some sedum, and the thistle. Just let it dry. And you have a lovely little bouquet to give to someone. Butterfly bush. Roses and Gomfrina. So a garden room or conservatory is different things to different people. To some it's a place to dine, it's a place of elegance, peace, serenity. To some it's a work area for planting, keeping your potted plants. For some, it's uh, an art studio. And for me, it's an art studio and a workshop for planting. This is an old jelly cupboard. And I've had this for about 30 years. I brought this with me from Colorado when I moved here a long time ago. But it's a lot older than that. Back in the days when they actually had jelly cupboards. <laughs> and this one does not have any jelly in it, but it has something even more important than jelly. Jelly cupboard contains the tea things. Because you've got to have tea in your garden room. I find these calendars every year because they have the most wonderful old artwork on them. Botanical artwork and insects, and vegetables. And this company is called Cavallini and they only use vintage images, vintage paintings, and they're just so beautiful. Every one of them is a work of art, but they're also great for me in here because they're great reference material if I have to paint a particular flower or perhaps an insect. And in that case up there, that one is just full of every kind of butterfly you can think of. Tour of this room in the next video, but I want to get over to another corner over here in the garden room and do a chore that I need to do before it gets too late. And that particular chore has to do with these apples and these pears that I collected off the trees. But first, let's take a look at these beautiful dried flowers that we gathered yesterday. So here we have some pink gomprina, zinnias, a wing plant, some lamb's ear, some zinnia, alliums, sedum, crepe myrtle, black-eyed susan. Ah, oh, what do we got up there? And then we have the goldenrod, the privet, the ironweed, some alliums, and some more sedum. But don't they look beautiful as they dry? And you can see that they just change to a more subtle color. Beautiful, romantic, old shades. And keeping watch over the entire room, up here on the top of the cellar's cabinet, is Sir Winston. Yes, he's seen better days, but I did buy him about 20 years ago at a craft show in California. And he's looking a, a little weary these days. This was long before I ever had any real chickens of my own. I just really wanted a chicken, so I just bought this guy from a taxidermist booth. But what I really need to get going here is the fruit. Now this is ugly fruit. Why is it ugly fruit? Because it's organic fruit and the skins on the pears look 
absolutely dreadful, but trust me, the inside of these is really, really good. My little apples, oh, they are not nearly as impressive as those peaches I showed you a couple weeks ago. But they came off the dwarf apple tree first time, and I think we really need to make an apple and a pear pie. Watch this. <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> it's kind of fun, isn't it? It is fun. Double egg. Huh. Time for a nice afternoon tea in the garden room. So in the jelly cupboard once again, I'm just going to have a very simple, casual tea. And I've got a nice collection of tea in this cupboard. One of the reasons that I have so much great tea is thanks to my lovely daughter-in-law, Hera, because she purchases wonderful boxes of tea for me. And it comes from all over the world. And she recently sent me a wonderful box from Fortnum and Mason. And so today we're going to try Darjeeling from Fortnum and Mason, which is an orange pico tea. We're going to have that with the apple pie, fresh from the oven. I've just laid a simple place setting here at the work table in the garden room. We've got a gorgeous bouquet over here. Let me show you what that is. Just picked these flowers. In Cosmos. Dahlia. I think it's a bridal bouquet. 
Prattle Bouquet Dahlia, the Hyacinth Beans, some more Gomfrina, some Butterfly Bush, some Red Sedum, and some White Sedum. So I just mixed and matched the china. This is from Marjolaine Bastine, the Dutch artist. And cups are from Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And the teapot is one of my enamelware pewter teapots from about uh, 1910 or so. Nothing fancy at this table today, but nevertheless, very beautiful. So let's cut that pie and steep that tea. Now, Darjeeling tea is grown high in the foothills of the Himalayas. An orange pico tea, which is a light, fragrant tea with a hint of spice to it. It just reminds me of a very common American tea which is Lipton tea, which was in just about every household in America back in the old days. And when I open it up, that's what I smell. That was one of the first teas I ever drank because it was always, we always had it in the house as I was growing up. But it's really light and golden and I do like orange pico tea. So let's give that a try. It's Fortnum and Mason, so it's got to be good. pie turned out really, really well. The crust didn't hold together so good after I cut it, but it doesn't matter. It's a good crust. And you should just use your own pastry crust, whatever that may be. There's so many different kinds of ways to make your pastry, and you probably have a favorite. The apples are still, um, you can taste them. They're still a little bit tart, but they were green, little green apples. And they're a little crunchy, too. If you like them soft, you might want to cook your pie a little bit longer, but this, um, I'm really pleased with this because the apples came from our tree. Jilin tea just may replace Earl Grey as my favorite tea. I love it. It's, it's much lighter, it's more fragrant, and it does have a little hint of spice to it. So as we're having tea here in the garden room, we have all sorts of books that we could look through. But I want to show you something from the Farmer's Almanac in 1835. I really love to collect these. And I'm going to leave you with a few words from the Farmer's Almanac from 18. 34 in September, the ninth month. The primal duties shine aloft like stars. The charities that soothe and heal and bless are scattered at the feet of man like flowers. The generous inclination, the just rule, kind wishes and good actions and pure thoughts. No mystery is here, no special boon. For high and not for low, for proudly graced and not for meek in heart, the smoke ascends to heaven as lightly from the cottage hearth as from the haughty palace. Ah, words of wisdom from 1834. Well, I will leave you with those lovely words. And the next time here in Hopalong Hollow, we will tour the rest of this garden room. We didn't even go to the other side of the room. We will do that because by then it should be finished. The light should be hung. So we'll see you hopefully next week, a little sooner than usual. From Hopalong Hollow, bye. This is Jerry. Bye.